So, with 2022 coming to an end, a lot of people are putting together lists of the year's best TV shows or movies. What fewer people are doing is reviewing the platforms that house that content, the streaming services. People have been talking about the streaming wars for what feels like forever now, but this year it seems that the war has reached new heights with big blockbuster shows, new entrants into the market, and massive mergers. So let's close out 2022 here on TLDR Business by reviewing the state of play in the streaming wars and seeing how the different combatants are faring. The most obvious place to start when it comes to streaming is Netflix. Content-wise, their slate looked pretty strong this year, with major hits placed almost perfectly throughout the year. They opened with a return to Bridgerton and a new hit, Inventing Anna. Then there were new seasons of always popular Stranger Things and Ozark, before closing the year with Dharma Monster and Wednesday, a show so popular that it's only the third Netflix series ever to reach a billion hours of viewership in its first month, the other two being Stranger Things 4, also out this year, and last year's Squid Games. On the business side of things, it did look a bit more rocky. The middle of 2022 was punctuated by a massive stock slump for Netflix, when investors reacted poorly to the fact that they'd actually lost subscribers in the second quarter. The first time ever that the streaming giant had failed to pick up more subscribers than they'd lost. It does seem that this was a bit of a blip though, but this news certainly spooked not only Netflix, but also the market more generally. That's because Netflix has always been the standard bearer for high-budget, streaming-focused content. So it's understandable that when this beacon of light for the industry appeared to be flickering out, all the other players who are only now doubling down on streaming got a little scared. We'll come back to that later in the video, but this market shock did have three very real practical impacts on Netflix. Firstly, they announced a new, cheaper, ad-supported tier of membership. Secondly, they finally announced a plan to crack down on password sharing, forcing more people to actually pay for their own subscription. And thirdly, they announced that they'd be putting a cap on content investment, although they did still spend $17 billion in 2022. All of those things combined, though, suggest a new, more serious Netflix. Previously, they'd used their seemingly never-ending growth to justify endless spend and lax user policies to investors. It seems that their strategy is changing now, though, with a more focused and business-like approach. This could serve them well and cut costs, but it also presents new challenges for a streaming service who, up until now, hasn't really ever had to say no. Netflix certainly isn't losing the streaming war, but they are looking a little less dominant than they did a year or two ago. Disney maybe has the opposite story to tell though, at least in 2022. After all, this was the year that they announced that they'd taken the crown away from Netflix, boasting more subscribers than any other company. However, when you drill into these numbers, you do find something a little fishy, with Disney actually counting Disney+, Plus, Hulu, and ESPN customers separately, despite the three being bundled together in many markets. Even when you break Disney Plus apart though, you still find a very competitive streamer with 164 million signups as of Q4 of 2022. That means that 2022 marks another stellar year for Disney Plus, with them displaying serious year-on-year -year growth since the service launched at the end of 2019. Now, Disney Plus is actually kind of a hard streaming service to talk about in a video like this, because what it actually features varies by country. Everywhere in the world, you'll find the main verticals on Disney Plus. That's Disney, Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, and National Geographic. From there, though, there's some variety. In the UK, for example, you can find all kinds of shows which don't appear on the US version of Disney Plus and are instead split off onto Hulu. We'll talk about that more in a moment, but the core Disney verticals do seem to have performed pretty well for them this year. Ultimately, all of them benefit from a pretty reliable audience of people who are always going to want more kids content or demand more Marvel or Star Wars. Now, those two latter categories did appear to be a little weakened this year, with mixed responses to some of Marvel's latest offerings. But all in all, with the demographics that matter, 
Content on Disney Plus went down quite well in 2020. Maybe the bigger issue, and certainly the bigger story over the last few weeks, is the shift at the top of the company, with former CEO Bob Iger taking back over from Bob Chapek, following Bob 2's turbulent run at the top. Now, we don't yet know how Iger will change the streaming service, but before leaving, Iger was keen to see more general interest programming on the platform, so we may see a shift away from the primarily children's and nerd culture-focused approach towards more general ABC-style viewing. There is a line for him, though, because Iger didn't want to see more adult shows ending up on the platform, something which has happened with the star brand internationally and could happen in the future if Hulu were to fully merge with Disney Plus in the years ahead. Ultimately, though, he might not have that much control over this going forward. Chapek steered Disney towards a more unified future, and with people increasingly unwilling to sign up for new streaming services, unbundling them now could be difficult. Iger also has a long history with Disney's movie business, so it's possible that we'll see him push for more and longer theatrical releases. This year, Pixar apparently have had to fight hard for a theatrical release of their movie Lightyear after a pandemic of cancelled theatrical releases. And this is something that Iger is more likely to be sympathetic to than Chapek was. So prepare yourself for some more expensive popcorn when Disney forces you to go to the cinema for the latest releases. Anyway, all of that combined, and the control of the business now shifting from one bob to the other, as well as the promise that streaming will become profitable for Disney by 2024, it's possible that times are changing at the House of Mouse. For now though, Disney has been able to be successful, if misleading, when chasing Netflix. And while their brands might have seen some diminishing value in 2022, it's still Disney and Marvel. People who are into superheroes and those with kids are going to continue lapping it up for a while to come. Let's quickly discuss Hulu too though, because while it's not an international player, it does have a very interesting year ahead. This year though, the service had some really stellar content, with shows like The Dropout not only receiving critical acclaim, but also myriad awards. The thing is, as much as viewers and reviewers might like the content on Hulu, it's the business side of things which is worrying for the platform. That's because Hulu has a pretty complex business model, with the Walt Disney Company owning a third of the business, Fox another third, and Comcast via NBC Universal the remaining third. Now, following Disney's acquisition of Fox, they became a majority owner, with the various stakeholders agreeing that they come to a new formal deal in 2024. This means that over the next year, both sides will begin negotiating, with the potential for either Disney or Comcast grabbing full control of Hulu. But regardless of the streamer's eventual owner, both sides look keen to kill the service. If Disney buys out Comcast, they'd likely do it with the vision of merging Disney Plus and Hulu in the US, like already is the case in much of the rest of the world. While if Comcast were to buy it, they'd likely want to move all of the popular content already on Hulu onto their much less popular Peacock streaming service, in order to beef up their offering and juice their subscription numbers. However, with budget cuts taking place across the streaming industry, it is an open question as to whether either side will be willing to spend the necessary funds to buy out the whole business. But whoever gets responsibility for Hulu going forward is likely to kill it in the years ahead. It's not what you think. Now, let's discuss Peacock really quickly, as I just mentioned them. Honestly, they could really do with acquiring some of that Hulu content I talked about because they're pretty low on series that people actually want. At launch, they seemingly thought that pulling in comfort viewing shows from across NBC, like notably pulling The Office from Netflix, would be enough to kickstart their success. But it's proven a little more difficult than that, with the streamer really struggling to pull in much of an audience at all. A lot of the subscribers they do have, though, come from the smash hit Yellowstone. But there's an issue there, too, because that's actually created by rival network Paramount. And while Peacock has the streaming rights for the main series, the likely lucrative spin-offs have been ring-fenced for Paramount+, Plus, with Paramount learning their lesson from the first time around. 
Now, there is talk that they could merge with Warner Brothers Discovery and the whole thing be pulled into Max, but without a merger like that, or some play with Hulu, it looks like this streamer is struggling hard. Before we get into the chaos over at WBD, let's discuss another struggler though. Paramount Plus is another legacy player in the industry who are struggling to compete in a modern world. Although, admittedly, they are doing about three times better than their NBC rival. They have also seen some decent growth throughout 2022, helped by having major franchises like Star Trek, Halo, and Nickelodeon under their belt. They've also benefited from being able to merge with Showtime Plus, pulling in yet more content into the bundle. The question, though, is whether this growth is sustainable, and if they can continue to grow like this. Right now, they're on the cusp of becoming a major player, and it's hard to tell if this is going to lead to continued success, or if they're just benefiting from an unsustainable upfront investment. That being said, the history of CBS, who are part of Paramount, does suggest that they could have some success in this area, with the network's strong track record for creating not necessarily critically acclaimed series, but shows which are incredibly popular with the general public. It's also possible, though, that this whole group could be bought up. Paramount currently has a market cap of only $11 billion, so if an Apple or Amazon kind of company wanted to bolster their content division, they could easily snap up the whole thing for relatively cheap. However, with Amazon's difficult and chaotic takeover of MGM still ongoing, they might be a little busy to acquire them at the moment. Speaking of Amazon, their streaming service Prime Video is likely much bigger than you expect, with them barely behind Netflix as the second biggest streamer. And this year, they seem to take that position a little more seriously too, with an updated UI making the service <laughs> passable, I guess, as well as a clear investment into content. The most obvious example of this is Rings of Power, the new Lord of the Rings spin-off, which cost a reported $60 million an episode, but which struggled to pull in the audience that Amazon likely hoped for. Now, it clearly resonated with an audience, but it does seem that they failed to capture the cultural resonance of previous similar series like Game of Thrones, with the Lord of the Rings franchise maybe a little less relevant than they hoped, and a little too well-mined for content in the past. Maybe more successful content-wise, though, was their massive investment in NFL Thursday Night Football, as well as sporting events around the world, from tennis to rugby. This less common strategy for streaming essentially forces sporting fans to sign up for Prime, which is great for sign-ups, but is very expensive to achieve, given the monumental price tag of primetime sport. Ultimately, Amazon is one of very few companies who could actually afford this strategy. They not only have a pretty endless well of money, but they also have a totally different business model when it comes to streaming. Amazon can afford to spend a fortune on Prime Video because every sign up for sports or dwarves is another person also getting Prime shipping bundled in, making them significantly more likely to spend money year round on Amazon. Ultimately then, 2022 was a mixed bag for Prime Video. Some huge moves and big subscriber numbers look good, but ultimately their objectives are so different from everyone else that they're barely playing the same game. Apple TV Plus is another outsider in this space though. Apple don't actually announce their subscriber numbers, so we don't know how they compare, but they're also not in the business of making money from content. Apple TV Plus plays as part of the company's wider services strategy, which is expected to eventually result in them charging a flat fee for not only Apple's services, but also hardware bundled in too. However, even though they're not really playing the traditional streaming game, Apple TV has had some pretty standout content. They don't have that much on the service, aiming for a more select boutique lineup, but what they do have generally has a much higher hit rate with shows like Ted Lasso, Severance, and Bad Sisters capturing a ton of attention and award buzz. Apple TV Plus, then, is all about building Apple's service offering more generally, and not so interested in just selling subscriptions. Regardless, though, they're a force that ought to be recognized in streaming. 
Let's close with maybe the most interesting players in 2022. The newly merged Warner Brothers Discovery. What makes this new business interesting is that both partners, Warner Brothers and Discovery, had their own streaming services before the merger. HBO Max and Discovery Plus. HBO Max follows in the legacy of HBO, focusing on fairly high-budget content designed to attract attention, win praise from critics, and awards. As such, HBO Max brings with it some incredibly valuable and highly acclaimed series, with Warner boasting some of the best IPs in streaming right now, and a brand in HBO with a real heritage and reputation for storytelling. On the other hand, Discovery Plus offers a vast array of popular, yet less noteworthy shows, which generally involve reality TV drama, home makeovers, or ghosts, sometimes all three. That's not to say this isn't a valuable proposition, though. Discovery has been able to make a killing in traditional TV by producing the kind of programming which isn't going to be the talk of the town during Emmy season, but the kind of stuff that you put on in the background while ironing. What I'm trying to say here is that these two streamers, now owned by a combined WBD, aren't all that similar. But what I'm also telling you is that WBD are expected to merge their two streaming services, HBO Max and Discovery Plus, into one streaming service called Max, whose combined subscriber total could even begin to rival Disney+. Plus. The question is what this means for their combined lineup. Will HBO continue to spend as much as they used to on prestige content if they have Discovery Plus glued to their side? Well, it's not off to a good start for fans of prestige TV. New CEO David Zaslov has scrapped a whole bunch of HBO content, including infamously canning the Batgirl movie before it was even released. Now, admittedly, a lot of these cancelled projects haven't been the big show-stopping HBO shows that people know and love, but it's easy to see why some are spooked by Zaslov. In fact, Zaslov has actively emphasised a focus on more profitable, cheaper programming, suggesting that the future of the business generally leans more discovery, cheaper to produce content, which is still very popular with the general public. And while this strategy might not be that popular with fancy TV viewers, Zaslov hopes that his experience with more casual content will help him to build a replacement for the background viewing of terrestrial or cable TV. Also, it's worth noting that his business does have $55 billion worth of debt associated with it. So cutbacks like this do make sense. But how will a more premium HBO fare attach to a, well, less prestigious network? Well, we'll have to wait and see if and when it happens. That focus from Zaslov away from premium content could be a broader trend for the industry going forward, though. Basically, all streaming services have promised cuts or spending caps in 2023, with a number of them assuring investors that their streaming businesses will be fully profitable by the middle of the decade, which is going to require further financial prudence. So who's winning in all of this? Well, with all of the streaming services offering intentionally hard to interpret data, it's basically impossible to tell. Netflix has had a difficult but ultimately successful year, with record-breaking viewership for series new and old. Disney Plus has seen continued growth, despite some negative reaction to their more recent content. Prime has continued to grow, maybe despite the actual video service, HBO saw 10 million people tune in for House of the Dragon, but under Warner Brothers' discovery, they're going through a difficult moment. So while we don't know who's winning, it's possible that we do know who's losing. Us. With cutbacks incoming, streaming boss and industry expert John Landgraf has referred to this year as the peak of peak TV, as streaming services end their approach of just burning money to achieve growth and chase Netflix's dominance and begin actually treating their businesses as, well, businesses. If you enjoyed this video and the content we've released here throughout the year, then be sure to subscribe to the channel and ring the bell for more in 2023.